member of National Briefing. And today's webinar, we're going to be discussing a new report from the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, and the title of, of that publication is called Building Better Health, Innovative Strategies from America's Business Leaders, a report from the CEO Council on Health and Innovation. Um, as many of you are aware, the CEO Council on Health and Innovation is a group of nine uh, chief executive officers from some of the nation's largest employers. And they joined together with the Bipartisan Policy Center to share some innovative strategies that they've used within their companies to improve health and health care. And they've made commitments, and they're going to encourage other companies to take similar actions to drive improvements in health and health care. And Janet was key, uh, Janet Archibroda, who is here with us today, was key in, in making this report happen. And she's going to share with us um, some, some of the details of this report. And then uh, we'll have an opportunity to ask her at the, some questions at the end of today's session. I've got just a few uh, announcements before we get started. Um, as many of you know, we've got early bird registration uh, that is going on for our annual fall conference, but it ends tomorrow. So please uh, go to pcpcc.org and sign up for our 2014 conference. And that, title, that conference is titled Patient-Centered Primary Care at the Heart of Value and Quality. And as um, we do each and every year, um, we have a terrific uh, agenda, lots of panels um, to engage folks uh, and learn from one another. Um, this year, we'll be holding our first ever award dinner, where we're going to honor the special contributions of three leaders that are dedicated to primary care. Um, many of you know Deborah Ness. Uh, Dr. Ted Winslow uh, and Dr. Jane Tully at the Southeast Medical Associates. Uh, they are awardees this year, and we hope you'll be joining us for that celebration dinner on Wednesday evening, um, and that's November 12th. And then finally, just wanted to let you know, many of you use our map at the PCPCC to, to learn about what's happening in various uh, states and, and regions around advanced primary care um, we are highlighting all kinds of terrific information, and we've got a new feature on that map that I think folks will find particularly useful. We've got a new outcomes view that allows uh, the users to filter program evaluation data and to look for, for outcomes by payer type, state, and date of publication. So for those of you who want to know, is there, is there cost savings? go to the outcomes view um, and, and search on cost savings. If you're looking for quality of care, um, search under quality, et cetera. Um, we also have a growing list of PCMH outcomes data that's been published in peer-reviewed journals and, and industry reports. You'll find that on the map. And of course, we'll be publishing that information in our annual update. Um, and you can find the database at pcpcc.org. Uh, back, backslash initiatives, and uh, you'll see our map highlighted there. So without further ado, um, the only general housekeeping for this webinar is that we, we do ask that you use the webinar software to ask questions and provide comments. And in order to do that, you've got to submit your questions in writing using the drop-down question box that's on your screen. As I mentioned, during the last 15 minutes, um, you'll have a, a chance um, to send in questions, and we'll ask Janet those questions. Um, Tara Hacker today will be facilitating uh, that process. Um, and then as many of you know, we make all our slides and the recorded presentation available uh, within the next 24 hours. So without further ado, Janet Marchabroda, I'm just going to hit on um, a few key points from her um, long and impressive bio. Um, and you can find that on our website. Um, uh, so, so we encourage you to go and take a look at, at at her longer bio there. But as many of you know, she is the Executive Director of the CEO Council on Health and Innovation at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, and she has um, been there um, for, for a while now. Um, that is following the two years that she served as Chair of BPC's Health Information Technology Initiative. Um, as many of you know, Janet has long been a, a leader nationally in health information technology. Um, she previously led the stakeholder engagement activities um, at the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at HHS, or the Office of the Coordinator. Um, she also served as Chief Health Care Officer for IBM. 
She served as the founding executive officer for the eHealth Initiative, which is um, back when I met her a long, long time ago. Um, and the eHealth Initiative is an independent, nonprofit, multi-stakeholder organization whose mission is to improve the quality, safety, and efficiency of healthcare through health IT. Um, she's been COO at the National Committee for Quality Assurance. Um, and as I've mentioned, she's a, a nationally recognized expert on HIT, um, but obviously she's, she's worked with lots of different folks in this city um, across two administrations, leaders in, in parties of, of both parties in Congress, et cetera. Um, she's been recognized as one of the top 25 women in healthcare by Modern Healthcare Magazine. Um, she's, she's kind of a big deal is the, is the bottom line. Um, she holds a, a BS in Commerce from the University of Virginia and an MBA with a concentration in organizational development from the George Washington University. So Janet, we are so thrilled that you have joined us today to tell us about this terrific report and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Marcy, for such a kind introduction. And I'm delighted to be joining you uh, and the members of the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative. You all um, have played such an instrumental role in, in raising awareness of the importance of primary care in the patient-centered medical home. And, and it's just a, just a great delight to be here. Um, and, you know, I was it's also great to be back, um, having been involved in your effort, uh, particularly your work around eHealth in the early years. So, so thank you. Um, so we're going to spend, let's see, it's 1.10 now Eastern time, probably about a half an hour. Um, and I'm going to run through uh, the report that we released last week with the CEO Council. A little bit about us uh, at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Been about, I've been there about three years, and it's actually based here in Washington. Um, it was established by former Senate Majority Leaders Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, Bob Dole, and George Mitchell, so folks on both sides of the aisle. And we came together uh, as an organization to have those conversations, robust dialogue, um, reasoned negotiation, research to try to find common ground on issues facing the nation. And, and you know, we focus on a lot of areas, including energy, economic policy, immigration, um, and of course, healthcare. So that's a little bit about our work at BPC. Um, so let's get into the CEO Council. What is it? Why did we pull it together? Who's involved? Um, it's a group of chairmen and chief executives of some of the nation's largest employers. This is an employer-driven effort at BPC who wanted, gosh, got together uh, last year, early last year, um, because they wanted to take actions to improve the health and wellness of, of their employees and their families and achieve higher quality, more cost-effective patient-centered care, you know, similar to the goals um, of, of your organization. They, uh, we've really focused, and, and when we talk about some of the calls to action, the commitments, and the strategies, um, are focused on three primary pillars, which are laid out here on the slides, um, and we'll talk about a little bit more. So, let me just, next, here we go. Um, so here, are the nine companies. Um, it's a very diverse group. Some were operating, many, operating outside of healthcare, um, such as uh, Bank of America um, and the Coca-Cola company, Verizon, um, McKinsey and Company, as well as uh, we've also got some significant healthcare leaders involved in healthcare. Uh, including Mark Bertolini at Aetna, Scott Sirota at the Blue Cross Blue Shield Associ and, and Blue Shield Association, Johnson and Johnson, and Walgreens. Um, so it's a pretty diverse group. They've come together. They held their first meeting back in July of 2013. We started our work a little bit before that. And one of the key things um, that was important to them is to be guided and informed. Um, if I go to the next slide, 
uh, by a healthcare advisory board, which really had a lot of experience and perspectives in healthcare. And you'll see some familiar folks here. I know Doug Henley has been very active, um, and his organization has been very active in your organization. He uh, so so the family physicians the pediatricians with Errol Alden's involvement, and some of the specialists, including um, the American College of Cardiology. We were really delighted also uh, to have the nurses involved in this effort, as well as uh, many of the organizations that represent both patients and individuals, including uh, the American Diabetes Association, the American Cancer Society, um, and the American Heart Association. So going to the next slide, um, so we're going to, this has a link, and um, if you go to um, www.healthinnovationcouncil.org, um, there is a web version of the entire report, but if we go to the next slide, I'll take you through um, some of the key elements before we get into Q&A. So if we could go to the next slide. There we go. So at 20,000 feet, um, it's a pretty long report So um, because it's got a lot of case examples. And in many respects, the website version is much easier to navigate. But at 20,000 feet, what the report contains, um, it's really organized around three primary pillars. And the CEO council members felt that operating in only one of the three was not sufficient but to really drive improvements in health and healthcare in our country, we needed to, number one, um, focus on improving the health and wellness of individuals. Um, in particular, what you'll see is, is initiatives focused on um, health and wellness for employees and their families, and in many cases, retirees. Um, let me go to the third one. Um, the other pillar was improving the healthcare system. And this is, you know, so many organizations are looking at what can we do to improve care delivery. And, and that's what that pillar is all about. And we'll talk about each of those in detail. But the second, and a very important one, um, is improving the health of communities at the community level. And so uh, the report is organized into those three areas. Um, as you scroll through, you'll see an overview of each of those areas you know, why it's important, what the common challenges are, and those will look familiar to you, I know, um, members of the collaborative. You'll also see some individual strategies that each company has used to drive improvement in each of these areas, and then um, a set of resources. The key component that I'm going to talk about today is the commitments and calls to action. Um, each the CEO Council, one of the key elements of our event last week, and, and five of the nine CEOs were able to uh, join with us in Washington, and then uh, very senior leaders uh, for the other four were also able to join along with the advisory board members. Um, the a major component of the announcement was the commitments that they were making and are making, and the calls to action uh, that are targeted actually to fellow CEOs and fellow employers in the United States. So if we go to the next slide, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, and bef whoops. Okay. before I do, um, and this is probably a question, and I know that a number of, you know, a number of reporters um, have asked this question. Why now? Why, why employers? Why are you focusing um, on some of these issues? And you all know, I guess I don't need to tell this group that, you know, about how much we spend on health care um, and that despite that spending, you know, we're still, we still rank pretty poorly even on some of the most basic measures of good health. But then why employers? And, and I know that, that um, the collaborative has done a lot of work with employers. I, I remember, and we've read a lot of your um, reports um, that are targeted to employers. 
But if you think about it, we, we often say, oh, what can the federal government do, you know, with their 46% of national health care expenditures in the, you know, coming from the federal government. But, you know, what the CEO council members really focused on was not what should the federal government do, but what should we do? What should we, what can we in the private sector do in order to improve health and health care? And it's really exciting very exciting to us, you know, at the Bipartisan Policy Center because together, if you count it up, if you look at um, the spend in terms of what employers spend and what their employees spend together, it's about 45% of the cost of the nation's health care. Um, so it's a big number and can have a big impact um, if employers work together to drive change. The other thing, and you'll see this a common theme you know, in the interviews and, and you know, in the dialogue among them, it's, it's a business issue, right? They believe that the health of our nation is vital to maintaining their competitiveness, particularly in the global marketplace. And so it's a matter of better health, better productivity, um, folks coming to work, being productive at work. Um, it is a matter of cost, yes, but cost was not the primary driver for this effort. And the other thought was um, the business community, um, you know, has a long history of being very innovative um, in driving improvement, um, whether it's through lean or other approaches, uh, you know, measurement, improvement, and, and so um, can really, are, are well positioned to drive change in healthcare. Okay, so um, I'm looking at the clock. We're at about 1.20. Um, we're going to tackle each of the three pillars. And what I'm going to do uh, is share the call to action, um, which are, which, and then we've got a menu of alternative employer actions, um, all of which we spent an enormous amount of time researching, discussing, um, gaining agreement on, on these different elements. So I'll run through those, provide a couple of examples um, for each, but there's a whole list of strategies um, of the companies that you can see in the report. So in the first area, uh, call to action. So, so uh, what they're saying um, and what we're saying is employers of, you know, in the United States to improve the health and wellness of individuals, you should really implement um, comprehensive health and wellness programs for employees that address the following needs. And you know, we lay them out here for those who are just on the phone and not on the web. Uh, these will sound familiar, right? Nutrition and physical activity, tobacco cessation, emotional and behavioral health, which was very important, and then chronic disease management or condition management. Um, you know, this came out of we still remember one of the meetings of the CEO council, I think it was the chairman and CEO of Verizon saying, you know, can we come up with an A-list? I mean, there are so many employers, particularly mid-level, medium-sized employers that not, are not quite sure where to go. Um, and, and so we came up, this is, this is a high-level view, there's a lot more detail in the report around an A-list, if you, if you will, of programs if implemented comprehensively, um, can have a real positive impact on health and outcomes, health outcomes. Now, there's another part here that's really important. Um, not only did they call for implementation of these programs, they also called for employers to begin tracking and sharing outcomes for these programs to support learning and improvement. And, um, you know, what's the why there? Uh, for those of you who have been doing a lot of research in this area, you probably know that uh, we could, so, so number one, the driver for them was, well, how do we figure out what works? And if you did it this way and you got better outcomes, I want to know about that. So there was this notion of if we can begin sharing initially amongst each other, uh, the outcomes of these programs, their impact on things like health outcomes, on productivity, 
ultimately cost, and that's hard to measure, um, then maybe we can do better and we can, we can all help each other um, in implementing health and wellness. And, you know, from a public policy standpoint, why do we care? Uh, as many of you know, you know, we could use a lot more evidence around what works and what doesn't work in this area. You know, unlike maybe a number of the providers on the phone um, or the academic centers, you probably do a lot more publishing in peer-reviewed journals than HR and employee benefits managers do just because it, it's part of the culture. And you see less of that in the employer community. And I think as a result, we don't always hear about all of the um, strategies and their outcomes in this particular community. So that's the call to action. Um, I'm going to try to, there we, so, so this is sort of a wordy, there are a lot of words on these slides. I think um, I'm looking at my time. I'm just going to quickly run through. In addition to the call to action, they have a longer menu of things that need to happen or that employers should consider. And the first is pretty broad-based, right? Can we all start sharing strategies and best practices? And if we go to the next slide, um, in the near term, um, here you'll see some parallels with the call to action that I just mentioned, you know, accelerating the adoption of these programs we just talked about. This third one, um, sort of near and dear to my other work at the Bipartisan Policy Center is, gosh, we use, almost all of us in America, um, more than 90% of us um, have cell phones or, or and, and I guess, so it's been two or three months since I looked at the data, more than half of those are smartphones, right? And we're, we're just beginning to, well, we're well into digitizing the U.S. healthcare system. And so if you look at the stories of each of these companies, you'll see that um, using electronic tools really helps them further engage more effectively their employees, um, and support them as they're navigating their health and health care. So we've got a whole section on using electronic tools to drive um, better engagement. And on the next slide, there we go. Um, other things, whoops, uh, going back, there we go. Um, things that are fairly common to many of you who represent the employer community, implementing incentives, of course, modifying your benefit design to encourage preventive activities, and then making prevention or preventive activities more accessible. Many of the um, uh, CEO council members bring these things on site, such as screenings, immunizations on site. And there are other ways to make them more accessible through benefit design um, and through partnerships with those who provide these services and then also supporting a smoke-free workplace. If we go uh, to the next slide, I'll try that. Here we go. Maybe um, this is the tracking that I talked about. And you know, maybe they are calling upon, we, we spent a lot of time, actually, on this particular item. They wanted to do more tracking. They wanted other employers to do more tracking and sharing of outcomes. And there are a long list of things that employers typically track to figure out whether a health and wellness program is working, um, including outcomes, costs, productivity, employee satisfaction. Um, but we spent a bit of time on, well, what will we start sharing first? And what you have here is a short list um, of common metrics uh, to begin sharing in the first year and then adding more over time. So you can see biometric measures such as blood glucose levels, blood pressure, cholesterol, um, and then behavioral measures related to nutrition, physical activity, and tobacco use, as well as uh, emotional and behavioral health measures. And then finally, uh, in the long term, of course, this evaluation point was important. If you, before we dive into the second pillar, you know, there are numerous individual strategies that are included in the report. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. Aetna talked about 
the voluntary programs that they have put in place to help reduce or reverse the effects of one of today's fastest growing health issues, and that's something called metabolic syndrome. Um, in the interest of time, you know, it's basically a grouping of five risk factors, things such as waist size, high blood pressure, cholesterol levels, et cetera, um, that really are, are um, aligned with lesser health, worse health outcomes. If that's, um, and they have put in place a program um, to address metabolic syndrome with, with results, very positive results, significant improvements in all five risk factors. Uh, they did this with their employees, and they have some other programs on stress management that are important to consider. Um, the other, in the interest, because I, I know we don't have much time, um, the other one I wanted to highlight today was Bank of America's program, um, their physical activity challenge. Um, for those that, that follow health and wellness, you'll, you'll find um, and the research shows that employer employee excuse me participation is one of the most difficult challenges for employers. You know they implement all of these programs, but overall, less than 20 percent of employees uh, participate in these programs. So it's a big issue. Um, well, the Bank of America implemented a physical activity challenge program. It was strictly a voluntary program. Um, and really great results. Um, and there are more details in the report if you go up to the website, but nearly 50%, 50 percent, 50 percent of the 200,000 or so Bank of America employees participated in this program that involved, um, you know, taking steps and physical activity over a prolonged period of time. And they've since actually extended this program not only to employees, but also their spouses or partners, and have had great, um, uh, great success in that area. So back to, uh, it's back in the interest of time, let's go to the second pillar. And this one, the call to action in front of you, um, to improve the health of communities, they are committing to and inviting, encouraging, other employers to commit to two things. First, to begin to understand or measure the health of communities, number one, and then number two, to actually collaborate with folks on the ground, local public and private sector uh, leaders on programs that will drive improvements in the list that follows. Um, health behaviors, Again, focus on physical activity, nutrition, and tobacco use, clinical care and outcomes. And again, there was a lot of discussion that went into this list, focusing on access to care, access to preventive services, and prevalence of chronic disease. And then the thir third one, um, also focusing on social and economic factors that have been shown to improve the health of communities. So things that are not healthcare related, um, but but are known to have an impact on health outcomes. So things like education, housing, access to nutritious foods and beverages, and childhood poverty. So before I go, um, well, let's, let's go to the menu and maybe in the interest of time, and then maybe I can explain why we think that they should begin tracking um, these outcomes. I'm going to try to go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so this is the first, uh, this is a repeat of what I just mentioned with more detail about what the measures are. Many of you, I'm not sure how many public health folks we have on the phone, but, but many of you know through the Healthy People Initiative at the CDC and, and other, I think Robert Wood, or Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is funding some, an initiative to measure the health of communities you know, states and regions, and there are a number um, of measures or metrics out there to measure the health of communities. But I'll tell you, in the discussions, um, you know, employers who drive jobs in individual markets, individual regions across the country, sometimes don't always pay attention to all of those measures. And so what this 
call to action is about, it's about paying attention to some of those metrics, um, both in the, in the communities in which they work, as well as the communities they serve. And so this is about measurement. And um, we're going to be shining a bright light on these measures as well uh, at the Bipartisan Policy Center. On the next slide, um, you'll see other things. Whoops. Uh, this, these, um, number three is about establishing national goals in relation to those numbers or metrics. And then also working side by side with local leaders to actually implement programs in these areas. And a number of foundations already do that, but not all of them do. And so, you know, targeting investments uh, on the programs that will have the most impact, we think, can, can play a big role in improving the health of communities. Um, and then number five it is along the same lines. When you're deciding where to expand, whether to um, build a new plant, a new office, you know, start a new local office, you know, paying attention to those community uh, health measures can be a wonderful incentive to local community leaders to pay attention to those issues because, as you know, economic development's a big thing. Um, as if you're a state or local leader, and this just helps to emphasize the importance of health. On the next slide, here we go. Third pillar, and this is good. We're almost done, and then we can op open it up to questions. So, so the third pillar, this is the one. You know, I know there are a number of um, providers that are involved in the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative. Um, this is the one about the healthcare system. So. Um, Oh, do I, did I put the, let's go back, call to action. Okay, um, as many of you know, only a few, there are, there are a small set of folks that measure uh, the percentage of payments in our country um, that are value-based. And the catalyst for payment, Susan Del Banco's organization um, measures this. And you know, we, we took a look at their measures. I think at la when the report was released, it looked like only about 11% of total payments in our country were value-based. And you know, that's not where we need to be. Uh, and I know we also know that there are a number of efforts that the federal government through CMMI and the states and, private, and the private sector is moving forward to increase the share of payments that are value-based as opposed to uh, volume-based. And so what this call to action is about is for employers to partner with their health plans to increase that number. You know, we tried to come up with a number, and um, we couldn't get there before the report. I know Suzanne's group has a goal. Um, secondly, it was important to promote reporting of meaningful, meaningful performance data. And we've got a number of factors that are laid out here. Um, tried to get, I know a number of folks are looking at um, developing a common set of metrics and dealing with the multiple performance measures out there. And that was clearly a recognition by the CEO council members. Um, and, and so we put this point in here. And then this is really, it speaks to one of your mission and your primary goals. This whole notion of building stronger relationships between in individuals and primary care providers was critically important. And would love to um, brainstorm with you or work with you on the specific actions that, that employers in particular can take to make that happen. And then, of course, um, making more transparent this performance information actually to, to folks on the ground, employees and other beneficiaries that are making healthcare decisions every day, um, whether um, you know, it's, it's their choice of a plan, a provider, where to get services, where um, higher value services um, are being delivered. 
And that's particularly important now in terms of the cost because, because the amount or the share of the health care bill that individuals are bearing, as you well know, it's increasing considerably. So, so um, this was the last call to action. And then if you look at our menu, uh, we've got a number of things in this area. And in the interest of time, um, let me walk through the things that are most important. Here's a new one here on this slide. Um, the first two are really related to the call to action that I just mentioned. But another thing that came up, and I don't know how much you've been following this, but we had a lot of discussions about online care and providing more access to care, convenient access to care um, for employees and their beneficiaries by uh, providing coverage options for telehealth for connected care and other technology-enabled tools that have been shown to be effective, um, remote patient monitoring, telemedicine, and the like. Um, and if we go to the next slide, those are some immediate term actions. Um, and then here you'll see things that look very familiar. Um, on item six here, uh, the whole electronic information sharing, you know, interoperability, and the need for information sharing was discussed a lot um, at the chairman and CEO level in the council and the lack thereof. And so there was a lot of discussion on, well, what steps can employers take to promote interoperability and information sharing? And uh, they're thinking, well, they cannot impact that directly um, by you know, encouraging providers to engage in this. Uh, would be important, and also to create transparency um, around the level of information sharing. Those are two ways that they could move this work forward. And then going, I think, let's see, there we go. Here we, oops, um, just going back one, there we go, individuals and primary care providers, transparency, and then of course developing educational resources, guides, and tools, and I know that's something that your organization spends a great deal of time um, and energy helping people move towards implementation. And this is sort of so this is more detail around the call to action. So so that's a quick overview of the calls to action um, and the menus of employer actions. And if we go to the next slide, so where do we go from here? Uh, so last week, I think it was September 16th, um, we released the report um, and the accompanying website and issued the call to action. What are we doing now? Um, we're having conversations like this, like the ones that we're having with you. Um, we're reaching out tactically, CEO to CEO, benefits manager to benefits manager, and then um, you know, working closely with with organizations that target employers to raise awareness of this, why it's important, and engaging employers to make a commitment to take action. Um, we'll be highlighting um, their leadership in this regard, you know, and issuing an annual progress report and, and celebrating major milestones, first 100, first 500, et cetera, employers that, that make this commitment. The other thing that we're doing is um, where two, two other things that came out of the report. We're currently working through how to facilitate information sharing among employers on outcomes of health and wellness programs. So that's the next big thing, as well as um, many of the CEO council members will be engaged in pilots that are designed to gauge the scalability of innovative strategies that have been shown to be effective in individual companies. And um, as we mentioned last week, as the CEOs mentioned in the release last week, uh, the first area of focus for pilots is going to be on wellness. And after considerable deliberation, um, building on the work that the council members have, have been engaged in, we're focusing first on a physical activity challenge. And I told you the story of Bank of America's work. There's other work. The Coca-Cola company has um, invested a great deal in communities across the country around physical activity. So we'll be doing some pilots in that area. 
and then just generally supporting successful implementation. So that's a quick, I've gone about a couple minutes over here on, on um, the prepared presentation, but uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, on the next slide, I've got, if you go, here's the website, um, www.healthinnovationcouncil.org. You can also get there by going to bipartisanpolicy.org. And um, it's a long report, but the website actually, depending on what you're looking for, if you want to look by company or by pillar, um, you'll see a lot of resources there to help you. And a long list of um, employer resources, including uh, links to your important work here at the Collaborative. So that's a quick overview. And I know we're going to go into questions. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. I just want to remind callers that in order to ask questions or provide comments, um, you just need to type it into your question or type your questions in using the drop-down question box on your um, dashboard. Um, sometimes, uh, um, so I'll go ahead and launch into the questions. Um, so one of the questions we had was focused on if any of the wellness and prevention initiatives uh, focus on family caregivers. Hmm. Yes. So if you look, so providing information to support family caregivers. I know that um, if you look, let's see, it's under the third pillar um, around providing access to information to patients and caregivers. Um, from the electronic health record was a really key component. Um, also, what you'll see in the report under the health and wellness programs um, is the use of electronic tools to support um, to support some of these programs. And you know, I think you'll see that on the improving the health of communities. Um, you'll also see some emphasis on that. But that's a really good point, and um, I'm happy to provide a full list of where caregivers are involved, and I'm glad you asked um, to the collaborative. Great. So another question um, was that, that you had mentioned that there are low percentages of participation in employer health and wellness programs. Um, so what are, what are some of the things that you've learned to push those levels of participation upward within an organization? For example, has uh, financial incentives for, for participation been effective in a sustainable way? Oh, that's a great question. So there has been a lot of research a lot. Maybe I shouldn't say a lot. There has been research around um, engagement levels in these programs. And I mentioned, gosh, average participation rates in programs such as those related to fitness, smoking cessation, weight, obesity, or disease management are typically less than 20%. Um, and why is that? Barriers can include things as you mentioned, insufficient incentives. Um, what has also been cited is inconvenient locations, time limitations, lack of interest, um, or just feeling that the program is a low priority. And there are a range of strategies that employers have used to address some of those challenges. Um, personalized communication has worked. Um, incentives, of course, have worked. Um, and team competition. I encourage you, if you look at the Bank of America example, remember I said earlier that their participation rates far exceeded, were more than double than average participation rates in these programs. And one of the things they did was they created competition among teams. And you'll see in that particular section of the report, you know, they had fun names. You know, there was electronic sharing. Just good old competition really helped uh, sustain engagement. 
Um, other things that we listed in the report, um, the use of social media and electronic tools, I think 29% of large companies or companies with 200 or more employees have used these tools. And now that they're more accessible and everybody has them, that can be um, a significant driver, whether it's connecting your wearable device um, to a program that helps you share with others, things of that nature. Janet, this is, this is Marcy. And I, too, want to thank you for your presentation. Um, you had asked. Uh, and answer this report, um, I have no doubt that there were a number of very interesting conversations that you had that helped inform the report. And you, you had said um, during the course of your presentation, um, for, for those folks in public health, um, this, this, was, this was, is an exciting report. It's something I'm seeing more and more of. Uh, yesterday, I was at the Institute of Medicine and got to hear folks who, who not unlike the CEOs here, who may or may not have been previously focused on the public's health, kind of writ large. Um, here we see the face of medicine really getting involved and invested in, in public health. And by that, I mean sort of the social determinants of health. This is something that we've not seen a lot in the employer community. And, and um, in your report, it's housed under improving the health of communities. But was there any, you know, how did, how did this conversation um, get started um, among the CEOs? Because they've typically been focused on the health and productivity of, of their own workforce. But this really sounds like they're focused on, on everyone's health and not just the health care but literally the health of. So are, are there any insights that, that you might offer the rest of us if the CEOs of America are talking about this? How, how can we um, emulate them in, in conversations that we're having in our community? So thank you, Marcy, for that question. You know, as you well know, medical care is just one determinant of health status and all those other things, our behaviors as individuals, our genetics, and then those social and economic factors play a significant role. And I think that there is not, while that's a growing discussion in the public, some of the public policy community and the public health community, it's not widely known. And I can say that many employers are not aware that social and economic factors have, or are not aware from an evidence base that social and environmental factors play a key role in health status. Um, and so this was an important um, finding and learning in the work of the council. Um, intuitively, it makes sense, and, and we, we thought that Number one, beginning to measure those things and shine a light on those things could help tremendously, particularly if employers who um, you know, bring jobs to communities across the country began to pay attention would be important. Um, along with um, investments and activities on the ground in communities in these areas. Um, another insight that was important was that just coming up with a, a program that an employer would implement in a silo didn't make sense. I mean, there was a lot of discussion around what this really takes is teaming on the ground, not only with other employers, uh, and in particular with a local business coalition, if one exists um, in that community, as well as local leaders, the mayor and the healthcare system, the leads the heads of hospitals in that region, the physician community, um, the schools, educational community, and, and the community-based organizations. You'll see a lot of that. If you were to flip through um, you know, the Coca-Cola company's work and, and um, Verizon and, and many folks, uh, Walgreens and others that have, and the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association in particular, you know, really teaming on the ground with other local leaders. So, uh, so long story short, I think we need to raise more awareness 
of this fact. You know, there are discussions at the IOM, and I know the RWJ is doing some work in this area, but I, I would say that the average American and the average employer is not aware um, of these other social determinants and their impact on health outcomes. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because that part of the report is um, it's overt in in how you have um, presented it, but I don't I don't know that that it will that it will jump out um, at at folks in the way that it jumped out at me. But you know, this is this is the first time that I can recall that we've got employers who are who are focused on the social determinants of health in such an overt way. And in that regard, you are just to be um, commended, um, certainly by me, as a public health person who, who um, it's been a long time in coming to get folks to understand the importance of the social determinants of health. Thank you. And we're really, we're just, we're very excited about the leadership demonstrated by the CEOs on the council. It's just tremendous. Thank you, Marcy. You bet. Sorry, Tara, I know I'm jumping in, and there may be other folks who, who have questions. I've, I've got more if, um, if, uh, if Tara, you don't, you don't have some for Janet. Uh, we did have a question on uh, what's the role of technology, and, and Janet, you had mentioned it earlier in your presentation, so if you just want to touch a little bit more on that piece. Sure. Um, so for those that uh, are familiar with our health innovation work at the Bipartisan Policy Center, you know, we do do a lot of work on technology, um, but it's not the primary focus of this particular report. That said, there was a lot of discussion, and you'll see themes that weave through each of the three pillars around what technology can do, be an enabler of all of this. Um, on the one hand, with the health and wellness of individuals, um, just the use of everyday tools that we all take for granted now to support engagement in our health and health care, help us decide where to get our care, uh, what, you know, where the best outcomes are, um, and if we're on the hook, as we increasingly are for our health care costs, you know, where's the best value? Um, on the second pillar, uh, you know, remote monitoring and the use of mobile technology is really helping to reach populations um, that have been hard to reach. And you'll see that in the Verizon strategies. Um, and then, of course, on the third pillar, and we've done a lot of work at the BPC around delivery system and payment reforms. And you just can't get there unless we've got um, electronic information flowing uh, across the care team between hospitals, primary care specialists. It's really hard to get to patient-centered, coordinated care um, without that information flowing. And in addition to that, and just as important, if not more important, is having those important connections between a primary care provider and, and his or her patient and electronic tools can, can take, can really help with that process. Janet, how, how do you plan to share and aggregate the community data via health plans or a community data source? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. Where, um, well, some, some folks wonder, well, why do you even have that in the report, and why do you want to share outcomes? And I think I mentioned during the discussion about the fact that um, there, is, there isn't much sharing today, uh, not because people don't want to share, but because uh, when you're trying, you probably know, the benefits teams of so many employers are very, very thinly staffed. And so the, the idea of publishing results um, is pretty tough just in the ongoing operations of things. So, so, but, but the flip side, or the reason why it's so important is, is we're never going to understand how to do things better, and the employers involved in this effort recognize that. So hence the sharing, uh, not to mention the fact that we could continue to build an evidence base 
around these programs. So, so how will the specifics on the how we'll share, you know, logistically, um, our, un, that work is underway. We did, prior to the release of the report, through a lot of discussion with the HR folks in each of the participating organizations, come to a, a set of common metrics that we would use um, that are outlined in the report. Things like blood glucose levels, blood pressure, cholesterol levels, obesity uh, rates, um, behavioral measures around activity, tobacco use, nutrition, and physical activity, and then some emotional and behavioral health measures, including those related to stress and depression. So we've come to a common set of core measures, still working on you know, the specific specifications for those measures and, and how to best um, capture those. We do so that's underway, and then we have committed to an annual progress report within one year's time, a report card, if you will, um, not only in aggregate, not only of CEO council members, but all of the employers that respond to the call to action. So thanks for asking that question. Well, that's, that's fantastic. We look forward to, to seeing those results. Um, and Jana, I just want to thank you again uh, for joining us today. We're coming to the end of the hour. I want to remind everyone that the, the PowerPoint slides and the recording of this webinar will be archived on our webinar, or on our website, uh, pcpcc.org. Um, so you can check that out in uh, 24 hours, and, and we'll have this up on our site. So thank, thank you all for participating in today's webinar. As a reminder, um, also, if um, just uh, our, our fall conference is um, coming up, and our early bird is soon approaching. So if, if you haven't yet registered for our conference, please do. And uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks again, Janet. Thanks very much.